You're good. Okay, how you doing everyone? This is Glenn, Stats with Glenn. This is chapter two, describing a single variable. Um, so you remember before we talked about two basic kinds of statistics at the end of chapter one. There's inferential statistics, which allow you to make inferences about whether a finding in a sample can be generalized to a broader population. And then there's descriptive statistics, which um, has two different phases. One is describing a single variable, and the second kind of descriptive stats is describing relationships among different variables. Chapter two is all about describing a single variable. So there's a couple of terminology kind of things we have to start with. Um, variables, values, so this is chapter two, and scores. So a variable is I'll put these in singular, sorry for the S's. A variable is some attribute and it could be about anything. It could be about a person, it could be about an animal, it could be about a plant, it could be about a building. It is some attribute that varies. Some attribute that varies. Um, Think about the way people vary from one another. We vary in gender, we uh, vary in terms of our hair color, we vary in terms of whether we like Joe Biden, whether we like Bernie Sanders, um, Elizabeth Warren, I guess I had to mention her. Um, we vary in terms of whether we like vegetables, what kind of vegetables we like, if we like vegetables. Um, we vary in terms of what music we like, we vary in terms of our personality. Some people are very outgoing. Some people are very introverted or not so outgoing. Some people are really big into the creative arts. Some people hate that stuff. People vary in terms of all kinds of dimensions. And each one of those attributes for which people vary, we call a variable um, as opposed to a constant. Here's a constant. So pretty much, with I guess very few exceptions, humans have two legs and we are bipedal. So that's been true about humans for hundreds of thousands of generations. Um, so that would be a constant. How many legs do you have? Two legs. There are some exceptions, unfortunate situations, and so forth. But basically, that's a constant, the number of legs you have. But how long your legs are, um, the skin tone of your, your legs, and so forth, these, how muscular your legs are, these are things that are variable. So any attribute that varies is a variable. There are different kinds of variables, and that's going to be the next thing that we'll be talking about. A value is a what, what I'll call a potential score on a variable. Um, so let's say that one variable for a stats class might be scores on exam. I've been teaching stats since 1996, and I've never had everyone in the class get exactly the same score as one another. Therefore, test scores or exam scores vary, so that's always a variable. Um, so this is the variable, and the values would be the potential scores. So you could, God forbid, get a zero. You could be a super student and get 100 or you could get some score in the middle. Each of those potential scores, before you even take the test, is a value. So a value is not like a real score, it is a potential score. Once someone actually gets a score, this is an actual piece of data for a variable. So the variable here is exam one scores. That's a dimension that has variability. Values are the potential scores that people could have. And then let's say that our friend Dana took the score and I'll put X equals, or took the test, and let's say she got a 99. Missed that one little point, Dana. 
Um, that would be an actual score. Okay, so these are the values. 99 is one potential score, but then when we're talking about someone's actual score, we'll use the word score. And we'll usually refer to it as X. So X equals means we're talking about a particular score corresponding to a particular case. In psychology research, that's usually a particular person. So variables, values, and scores, concepts we'll be talking about throughout. We have three basic types of variables. Three basic types of variables, and as you'll see, the kind of variable you have determines what kind of statistic that you end up doing later on. So different types of variables um, relate to different kinds of statistics. We have, let me just make sure I have the same order as I have it in the book, we have what we call a continuous variable. Then we have what we call an ordinal variable. And then what we have what we call a categorical. So these are three basic kinds of variables. A continuous variable is one where um, the values differ by degree. Okay, so as an example of these, I'm going to talk about academic success. So we can think about academic success and ways that we can measure it using variables that differ in terms of these three basic kinds of variables. Um, a continuous measure of academic success would be GPA. GPA goes from 0 to 4.0, or if you're in high school, it might go from 0 to 100. And an important thing about a continuous variable is that differences at different parts of the range have the same meaning. And so what I mean by that is that let's say we have, let's say we think about it as zero to 100. Let's say one person scored 85, another person scored 80. And let's say another person scored 65, and then another person scored 60 barely past high school right there. So imagine we have these four people with these four scores. The fact that this is a difference of five points and the fact that this is a difference of five points is meaningful. This person with 85 did just as much better than did this person with an 80 as this person with a 65 did relative to this person with a 60. So with a continuous measure, um, sections of the range are meaningful in terms of how much they encompass. So these are meaningful differences. So that's a continuous variable that we use for academic success, which would be GPA. Now, here's something different, which is ordinal. An ordinal variable is one where it's just rank ordered data. So let me give you some data to think about. I'm going to give you a really small graduating class. So this is Podunk High School. It's in the Adirondacks. There's four kids who graduated. Sally, this is going to be Joe, no, 
This is going to be Bernie. This is Joe down here. They're just names, kids. They're just names. And here's different ways we could do it. Okay, so here's the GPA. I want to put Tom was really a great student and he got 100. Good for Tom. He's going to a great school next year. Sally, for 12 years, worked so hard to match Tom and she came one point short. Sad story for Sally. Bernie did kind of okay. He got an 85. He's going to a good state school next year. Joe, 24. Not so good, Joe. Okay, now think about it. Looking at the GPA, we know quite a bit about these people, right? We know that there's two students who are incredibly strong. There's almost no difference at all between Tom's GPA and Sally's GPA. We know that Bernie did a good step below both of them, right? 85 is a lot lower than 99 relative to 99 compared to 100. This is a continuous measure, so we can make those inferences. And Joe Bomb. Right? Joe wasn't even like on the scale with everyone else. So when we have a continuous measure, we can really have finely grained nuances that we're talking about. It's really, really um, powerful and helpful. Now, when you're talking about high school, we also have ordinal data. You probably remember what number you were in your senior graduating class. I remember that my GPA was about 84 and I was about 84th in my class. So I feel very lucky to be here in spite of all that. I ended up doing fine. But order is something different, right? So here, Tom is number one, Sally is number two, Bernie is number three, Joe is number four. Remember, only four people graduated from this particular high school this particular year. Here, we don't really know the same information we know with the continuous measure, right? Because it could be, it's not, but it could be that everyone did great. It could be that Tom got 100 GPA, Sally got 99, Bernie got 98, and Joe got 97. You can imagine a universe where this would be the rank order, one, two, three, and four, but everyone was very, very academically elite. But if you look at the GPA, that is not the case at all. So ordinal data, when you just put things in order, you don't have a sense of the magnitude of differences between the scores at the different levels, which is why I always tell students that if you're making a measure, if you're making a scale, and you will be in your research methods classes and maybe in some future projects when you kind of grow up and create measures for various kinds of professions, if you have a choice of measuring something as a continuous variable or as an ordinal variable, always choose the continuous variable. It gives you so much more information. The information is a million times more rich and you can always convert continuous measures to ordinal, but you can never convert ordinal to continuous. So this is definitely the way to go. And I emphasize that because I've overseen tons of student research and the number of students who come in and think that they're gonna measure something in an ordinal way. I don't really understand why, but it's very intuitive for people to do that. Don't do that. If you can measure things continuously, do that. Finally, we have what we call categorical. Categorical data is where the values represent different categories. So just as you lose a lot of information when you go from continuous to ordinal, you lose even more information when you go from ordinal to categorical. So categorical might be, for instance, some schools will have students put on like a college track versus a non-college track. And 
And so you might have Tom, Sally, and Bernie all tag with a C as college track, and you might have Joe tag as non-college track in the, the, the high school's data set, and you don't really know. Like, you don't know that Bernie did a lot worse than Sally, than Sally did relative to Tom. All you know is that those three are sort of in this general college track category, and that Joe is not in that particular category. You're losing even more information when you go to categorical. There are times when you have to use categorical data, and there are times when you have to use ordinal data, so I'm not saying that these are things to just completely throw out, but when we have the option, Continuous data is always the best. Um, categorical data sometimes is impossible to get around. If you're doing a study of how cats behave versus how dogs behave, cats are different than dogs, they're in different categories, and you must use a categorical variable in that particular case. So it really depends on your situation. But again, if you have a choice, continuous variables are always the way to go. Okay, when we're describing a single variable, I'm gonna focus mostly on continuous variables, largely because like I've said, that's just the best kind of variable for us to deal with for lots of different reasons. So here's a realistic kind of situation. Every college and university in the country just about has an office of what they call institutional research. So if you like stats and you're good at this and you want to use these skills, there's lots of professions and lots of kinds of offices and industries that you could go into. One of them is working at a university um, for an office of institutional research. Where you're doing research for the university to help the university understand its strengths and weaknesses and help the university improve in various ways. So imagine the scenario. It's your first job out of college. You're working for your Office of Institutional Research. You loved your stats so much that you ended up following that and pursuing that and embracing that, and that was your first job. Your boss comes in and says, here's your first job. I want you to see and to describe the starting salaries of people who majored in different academic majors. So you have data from students who majored in biology. You have data from people who majored in psychology. And you have data from people who majored in sociology. Your boss says, we only have enough resources so that you can study five people from each of these categories. You'll see a lot of times the examples I use have small numbers just to make the math easier and to make the concepts more accessible. So we have five alumni um, from each of these majors. Biology, one person made 35,000. The next person made 30,000. These are starting salaries. Next person made 25,000. Next person also made 25,000. And this other person made 34,000. So those are the biology starting salaries. Psychology, not quite as high. First person had 22,000. Next one had 19,000, still living home with mom and dad. Next one had 30,000. Next one, 24,000. And the last one had 25,000. Sociology. Sociologists were not making so much. The first one was making $8,000. Next one, $19,000. The next one, $15,000. The next one, $10,000. And finally, we have what we're gonna call an outlier. So an outlier is someone who has a score that is kind of on a different scale than everyone else. This one guy made $2 million. This is actually based on a real world example, by the way. Um, there was an analysis like this done at Duke University years ago. They had a basketball player named Christian Leitner who made it into the NBA. Um, he was a huge star, he had a very high starting salary, and he was a sociology major. And that was the only year at Duke University that the highest average first year salary was for sociology. 
so something to think about. Okay, so how do we describe these scores? There's two basic ways that we'll do it. One has to do with what we call central tendency. Central tendency is a way to summarize typical scores. So a lot of times we don't really care about individual scores. A lot of times like your boss isn't interested in this particular individual. Your boss is interested in how well paying were the jobs for the biology alumni. Your boss isn't interested in this particular psychology student. Your boss is like overall typically how well do the psychology students do in terms of their starting salary and so forth. Sometimes we'll call these the summary statistics because they summarize um, groups of data or samples of data. So central tendency is the first thing that we'll do. And there's three basic kinds of central tendency. Um, we have what we call mean, median, and mode. The mean is the arithmetic average, and this will be the first time that I've going to throw some Greek symbols at you. They will keep coming the rest of the semester. The mean is sigma, so that's capital sigma. Make sure to get your lowercase and your capital straight because they usually mean something different. X, X means an individual score. So sigma means add up all the X's and then divide by N, which is the number of scores. So number of scores, X is each individual score, capital sigma means add them all up. So the mean represented by M, in this particular case, we're gonna add up all these scores. And once we get that sum, we're gonna divide that sum by five. So we're adding up all the scores, all five of them, and we're dividing by five with the number of scores. This is just how we compute the average. So the average here is 29,800. The average over here, or the mean here is 24,000. And the mean for sociology is 410,400. Now remember, the point of an index of central tendency is to try to get a sense of what typical scores are like. For biology, the mean is 29,800. If you look at the actual scores, that's kind of in the ballpark. It seems to represent well the typical scores. For psychology, the mean is 24,000. If you look at the actual scores, again, 24,000 is kind of on the scale, kind of in the ballpark. For sociology majors, we have something totally different. So here we have the mean is 410,000. For these first four people, that's nowhere near what they're making, right? They probably cry to see that. And this person making $2 million, it's nowhere near what that person's making, and that person would probably also cry to see that. So 410,000 in this case is not representative of anything. Um, that's a problem when we have an outlier. That's a problem that happens when we have a score that is off the scale from all the other scores. So the mean tends to be our best index of central tendency with the caveat that it doesn't do so well when we have an outlier. The median is kind of like the median of the highway. So if you're driving down the highway, you know that thing in the middle that you're not supposed to cross over. It's the thing that's in the middle, it is the median. And so the median means the same thing. The median is the middlemost number when, this part's important, when the numbers are arranged in sequence.
So the median is the middlemost number. Just like in the highways, that thing in the middle, when your numbers are in order, is that thing in the middle. So if I take the biology scores and I arrange them in order, that's 25,000, 25,000, 30,000, 34,000, 35,000. And the number that's in the middle is 30,000. So here, the median equals 30,000. The median for psychology is 24,000. Same as the mean, place where that works out. And the median for sociology, the middlemost number is 15,000. For biology and psychology, it doesn't really seem to matter. The median and the mode are very close to each other. I'm sorry, the median and the mean are very close to each other. But for sociology, it makes a big difference. Because for the sociology scores, that median of 15,000 is so much more typical of the lion's share of the scores, of, of these four scores. Again, this one's an outlier. So this is a case where the median is actually a better representation of scores more generally. Finally, we have the mode. And the mode is, is defined as the most common score. I will tell you that we use the word mode in a more flexible sense later in the semester, um, as you'll see, but for now we can think of it as the most common score in a sample of data. So what is the most common score for biology? There's one score that happens twice, that's 25,000, so that is the mode. Um, for psychology, There's no score that's more common than any other score, so there's no mode, and that's fine if you get that on an exam, you can just write no mode. And that same thing is true for sociology, there's no mode. So these are the basic ways that we summarize central tendency for a single variable. In addition to central tendency, we have something that we call variability. So central tendency is um, talking about typical scores. Variability is talking about how the scores in the sample vary from one another. Okay, so here's an example. We've got a basketball game, and we've got Team A and Team B. They each have five players, and on Team A, everyone scored 20 points. sums to 100. The game ended in a tie, it was 100 to 100. On team B, the first guy scored 50 points, these three guys got nothing, and then this last guy got 50 points. So that team also got 100 points in total. So while it was a tie game, if you look at the scores, you can already get a sense that you're looking at two very different teams. Right? And you know that based on patterns of variability. These scores do not vary at all from one another. 20 does not vary from 20, and so forth. So there is zero variability here. 
which is intentionally being used to make a point of what does it mean to have zero variability. So this is zero variability. Team B, we have not zero variability, right? The scores are not all the same as each other. Some got zero, some got 50. So here we have variability. So when we come up with measures of variability, or measures of how much the scores vary from one another, we should find lower variability here based on whatever those metrics are, and we should find higher variability over here. This part's really important. Um, a lot of the future stuff in this class is derived from how we think about measuring variability. Okay, so here's the basic thing that we do. To figure out the indices of variability that we use, the first thing that we're going to do is subtract out the mean from each score. The mean, remember the mean is the sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. So 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 is 100 divided by 5 is 20. So the mean is 20. If we subtract out the mean, from each score, we're going to get our very first index of variability, which is x minus m, which we call the deviation score. Deviation score speaks to how much each particular score deviates from the mean. 20 minus 20 is 0, and that's true in each of these cases. Now you remember, these scores vary zero from one another, so every measure of variability that we come up with should tell us zero variability. Deviation scores are all zero. For reasons that I'll explain in a little bit, we square these deviation scores. This is really something we're doing simply for the mathematical function. Um, so these are called square deviation scores. Zero square in each case is zero. It'll make more sense why we do that when we get to team B. So those are the square deviation scores. You remember, um, descriptive statistics are not comments about individual scores, but they're summaries about um, overall patterns. So we're now going to come up with three different summaries of overall variability for team A. The first thing we're going to do is this, sigma x minus m squared, okay, so here's x minus m squared, when I put the sigma in front of it, that just means sum that up. So it looks fancy, it looks complicated, it just means add those numbers, that's all that means. Sometimes we will refer to this as SS which simply stands for the sum of the square deviation scores, but the longer version is sigma parentheses x minus m um, squared. Add those up, that is zero. So the sum of the square deviation scores is zero. The next thing that we're gonna do, we call it sd squared, which is what we call the variance. The variance is essentially the average of the sum of the square deviation scores. So it is sigma x minus m squared divided by m. Right? When we divide by the number of scores, we're getting the average. Um, 0 divided by 5 is 0. So again, we still have 0. Every index of variability is telling us 0. That's good because the scores vary 0 from 1 another. SD squared can finally be converted to what's called SD, which is the square root of SD squared. Uh, SD stands for what we call standard deviation. Standard deviation is roughly, and you, 
you'll see it's not exactly this mathematically, but we use it as a proxy. It is roughly the average amount that the scores vary from the mean in the sample. It is the square root of the variance, and the square root of zero equals zero. Standard deviation, and we'll see it more with team B, standard deviation is cool because when we squared things at this level, the square deviation scores, we brought all the scores to a different scale, the world of squared scores. And when we take the square root of the variance and come up with the standard deviation, we're bringing the numbers back to the world that we started. Um, so that's why we're taking the square root here. But a simple bottom line that I want people to take away from this is the fact that the scores do not vary from one another. Every single index of variability tells us zero variability. So that's what happens when you have zero variability. What happens when we actually have variability? So this is team B. And we can do the same process. We can figure out the deviation scores by subtracting out the mean. The mean for team B is also 20. Remember the mean is you add up all the scores, 50 plus zero plus zero plus zero plus 50 is 100. So 100 divided by N, or the number of scores divided by five, equals 20. So M equals 20. So just like the mean is 20 over there, the mean is 20 over here. Next, we're gonna get the deviation scores. X minus M, how much does each particular score deviate from the mean? Here, none of the scores deviated from the mean. Here, all the scores are gonna deviate from the mean. No one scored 20. So this one is 50 minus 20 is 30. That raw score is 30 above the mean. Zero minus 20 is negative 20. Negative 20 again, negative 20 again. And 50 minus 20 is 30. So these deviation scores are substantially different from the deviation scores over here. One way to check your work, by the way, is that how these things are calculated, the deviation scores should sum to zero, and they do in this particular case. It's a good way to check your work. Um, and the next thing we're gonna do is square these. Squaring them has the effect of getting rid of all these negative signs. All measures of variability need to be positive. You can't, there's no such thing as negative variability. So to get rid of those negative signs, that's really why we're squaring these right now. So these are the square deviation scores, which is 900, 400, 400, 400 again, and 900. And again, if you look at the square deviation scores here, these were all zero because there's zero variability between the scores. Here we have variability between the scores and these numbers are all not zero. The sum of the square deviation scores, sigma x minus m square, is 3,000. So if we add up all this, 3,000. The sum of the square deviation scores for that first team A was zero, for this group it's 3,000. Big difference. The variance, SD squared, which is the average of the sum of the square deviation scores, or the sum of the square deviation scores divided by N, is 3,000 divided by five, which is 600. So the variance is 600. Variance is kind of cool, but it's got a problem. 600 is not on the scale that the scores start on. The scores are basketball player scores in a single game. 50, which is high for basketball score. Zero, which is highly possible. But 600 is off that scale. The reason it's off that scale is because to get rid of these negative signs, we squared things along the way. This is the reason that we will now get the square root, or get the standard deviation, which is the square root of SD squared, square root of 600, which is 24.
So the average amount, roughly, that scores vary from each other here is 24.49. Now this is on the scale that the score started in, so you can interpret it and think about it that way, as opposed to over here, the standard deviation was zero. Again, saying scores vary zero from one another. This process is really important because it's gonna be used in just about all the processes moving forward. Okay, a final section of this chapter has to do with representing a single score or a single variable visually. representing a single score visually. So there's a few ways that we can do this. The one thing that we're gonna talk about is a frequency table. A frequency table represents how frequent different values are. Okay, so let's say we have a variable of x, and let's say this is attitude about, I don't know if this will stay current, but I'll sometimes ask my students attitude about some popular figure, and you know who's very controversial is Justin Bieber. You get really mixed data on that guy, I'm not quite sure why, but this is attitude about Justin Bieber. And let's say this is on a 1 to 10 scale, and I'll show you the kind of data I usually get from my students. I will get a couple of 1s, I'll get a 9, I'll get a 2, maybe an 8, then you got the fans over here, there's a couple of 10s, and then maybe you got some people that put 5 or 6, and then I'll end with a 5. This is about what I've asked my students, and I have asked my students, what do you think of Justin Bieber? This is about what the data look like. Um, as demarcated on pages 26 and 27, there's five steps in creating a frequency table. A frequency table is a way to take the data from a single variable and just make it more accessible. So like right now, if you just look at the raw data over here, it's kind of like hard to exactly see what the pattern is but a frequency table makes it more coherent. We're gonna go over about two or three different graphical or visual ways to make the data more coherent. So these are the steps. The first step is you're gonna make a column for all possible values. So it looks like, the, and you're gonna start, we do this in descending order. There's no great reason for that, but that's the tradition. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Okay, so a column for all the possible values. Um, then we're gonna make a column for what we call tick marks. So tick marks, we're actually going to um, cross off each score, kind of old school, and then we're just going to make little marks right there for each one we cross off. Uh, step number three is going to be a column called frequency. And 
and step number four, we're going to um, demarcate each raw score using tick marks. And number five, we're going to write the values, or write the, I'm sorry, write the frequency. for each value. Okay, so again, this part's really old school. This one gets represented by this tick mark here. This one gets represented by this tick mark. This nine is gonna be represented here. This two is represented here. Eight is represented up here. Both of these tens make it up here. Five is represented six is represented once and five is represented a second time. So that's just what I mean by the tick marks. If you have more than five, you know, you make the tally to represent five and then you can make another cluster of tick marks. And then this final step is we're gonna write the frequency for each value. So 10 happens two times. The frequency means how frequent was that particular value. 10 happens twice, nine happens once, Eight happens once, seven happens zero, six happens once, five happens twice, four and three happens zero, two happens once, and one happens twice. So this is a frequency table, representing how frequent each of these values is in the raw data. Now in addition to a frequency table, sometimes we can make it what we call a group frequency table. Now if we look at this table, we take the data that we had and it's more coherent but we can make it even more coherent than that by using what's called a group frequency table. In a group frequency table, um, you use intervals representing clusters of values. And the number of intervals that you use is really up to you, and it's really up to your data. So it kind of depends on your situation. So we might want to say, here's the intervals. And this is all um, described in detail on page 27 and 28. And we might want to say, instead of having each value represented, we might want to have them be like two. So we might want to have nine to 10, um, seven to eight, five to six, um, three to four, and one to two. So here we have, instead of representing each individual value, we can have these intervals that represent clusters of values and otherwise, the group frequency table progresses exactly the same as making the frequency table. So we're going to make our tick marks, and we're going to make our frequency. So let's go back to the original data. Um, maybe I'll use pink in this particular case just to represent the new tick marks. OK, so we have these two ones. They'll both go over here, um, nine and two. So the nine goes in this interval, the two goes in this interval. Um, eight, 10, and 10. So here we have eight and then 10 and 10 both go up there. Then we have five, six, and five, which all go into the same interval. So you can see when you do a group frequency table, it's kind of like more coherent. It's kind of giving you like a more overall overview kind of perspective on your data.
So here that first interval is represented three times, the second one is represented once, this one is represented three times, three to four is represented zero, and one to two is represented three. So this is kind of a more coherent way of summarizing it. And if you were looking at that and thinking about the variable we were studying, which is attitudes about Justin Bieber, we kind of see that people are split. Some people really love him, fangirls we call them. Some people are kind of in the middle, probably don't really care much one way or the other, and some people really don't seem to like this guy based on these data. So that's a group frequency table. Two more ways that we can represent the data visually. One is what we call a frequency histogram. Frequency histogram speaks to, is, well, it's pretty much a bar graph. That represents either a frequency table or a group frequency table. So there's three steps as demarcated on page 28. Um, well, why don't we do a frequency histogram for this group frequency table right here. And the first thing you do is you make your x-axis and that is going to be the x variable which will represent your intervals. If it's a group frequency table, the x-axis will be your intervals. If you're going to use a histogram for a regular frequency table, your values would just be values of x. But we're going to do the histogram for the grouped frequency table. So here, it's going to start with 1 to 2 as an interval, 3 to 4, 5 to 6, 7 to 8, and 9 to 10. So we have these five intervals representing scores in terms of people's attitudes about Justin Bieber. Remember, low scores meant don't like them, high scores mean love the beeps. Um, the y-axis is going to be frequency. That doesn't look good, let me write that better. So this is frequency. The most frequent we're gonna run into is going to be three. So I can put this as zero, one, two, and three. The most frequent interval based on what we know from the group frequency table is three. So now we're just going to put bars representing how frequent each interval is. And the only other rule I'm going to tell you, and this is just for aesthetics so that it looks good, we're going to make the bars touch each other. So one to two has a frequency of three. That means that there were three people who scored in the one to two range. So I'm going to put a bar right there representing the three people who put one or two. Zero people put three to four, so I'm actually gonna leave that be. Three people put five to six, so I'll put that over here. Um, one person put seven to eight. The one is over here, so I'm gonna put this like this. And then three people put between nine and 10. That is the frequency histogram for the group frequency table. And it's even more coherent, so it's easier to look at. You can more quickly say, oh look, there's a bunch of people that are neutral, there's a bunch of people that, that love him, there's a bunch of people that hate him. That's kind of the general pattern. So the whole point of these descriptive stats is making it so that you can really understand what are your data saying, what do, the, what do your data represent. Similar to the um, frequency histogram, the final one of these we're going to go over is a frequency polygon. Frequency polygon is essentially a line graph. 
It is a line graph that represents either your frequency table or your grouped frequency table. Um, as described on pages 29 to 30, it's, the process is almost exactly the same as the histogram with a couple of little changes. So we're going to make our x-axis is going to be the intervals, 1 to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 6, 7 to 8, and 9 to 10. Now here's something that students sometimes find a little weird. You'll see the reason for it. We're going to add an interval below the lowest, so this would be negative 1 to 0, and we're going to add an interval above the highest, so this would be 11 to 12. Now we know the scale was 1 to 10, so we know these are going to be 0 in frequency, but that's actually intentional, as you'll see. Um, otherwise, the y-axis still represents frequency. We still have 0, 1, 2, and 3, because the most frequent interval was 3, and no more than 3, so we're going to go up to that. The next thing that we're going to do is for each interval, we're going to make a dot. So negative 1 to 0 happens 0 times. So putting a dot right, right on the x-axis. Um, 1 to 2 happened 3 times. So I'm going to put a dot up here. 3 to 4 happened 0 times. So I'm going to put a dot down here. 5 to 6 happened 3 times. Dot up here. Um, 7 to 8 happened 1 time. Dot over here. 9 to 10 happened 3 times and 11 to 12 happened zero times. So those dots are similar to the bars in the histogram. The final step in the making of the frequency polygon, I'm gonna connect these dots with straight lines that go sequentially across the x-axis. And this is thought to be an even more coherent way to take a look at what our data are telling us. So it's a lot like the frequency histogram, except now it kind of um, has even more shape to it. And again, we can see there's these three peaks, and so there's three relatively common parts of the distribution. The haters, one to two, the neutral people, five to six, and the lovers, nine to so those are the three different relatively common parts of the distribution. The final section in this chapter has to do with information we get from the frequency polygon. So the frequency polygon is really useful for statisticians because we can make inferences about the data. So the frequency polygon allows for inferences. And the inferences are in terms of A, what I'll call modality, B, what I'll call skewness, and C, what I'll call kurtosis. So modality corresponds to how many relatively common parts of the distribution are there. Sometimes you'll get a frequency polygon that might look something like that. And if you had a frequency polygon that looked like this up here, that means there's one single relatively common part of the distribution. In this case here, we have three relatively common parts of our distribution. So we have three what I'm going to call modal parts of the range. That's useful. If you were going to write up a report on this, you would definitely say there was essentially three kinds of people who filled out the questionnaire, people that really disliked Justin Bieber, people that felt neutral, and people that could not get enough of Justin Bieber because um, there's three modes or modal parts of that distribution.
skewness corresponds to if um, one part of the range is disproportionately represented. exists if one part of the range is disproportionately represented. We don't really have that in this case. What skewness would look like would be something like this. If you had a distribution where there was not that much in the lower scores, but there was a lot in the higher scores, you would say that is a skewed distribution. You could also have a skewed distribution that looks the other way, kind of like that. There's a lot of scores that are in the lower part of the X range, not a lot of scores that are in the higher part, that is also a skewed distribution. So our distribution is kind of weird looking, but it's not skewed. It's not like there's one part higher or low that's very disproportionately over or underrepresented. The final thing is kurtosis, and kurtosis has to do with the degree to which the main peak Approximates um, what is found in a normal distribution. So, kurtosis is basically the degree to which the main peak in your distribution approximates what is found in a normal distribution. Now, a normal distribution we're gonna learn about in detail in I think chapter six, so coming up later, but it's a mathematically determined distribution that is symmetrical and that has a peak that is what I'm gonna call just so. Um, once you've seen a lot of normal distributions, you have a good sense of the peak of a normal distribution. You can have kurtosis in two ways. Um, you could have kurtosis if you're distribution is much more peaked than a normal distribution, or you can have kurtosis if your distribution is much less peaked than a normal distribution. And the frequency polygon can sometimes give us a hint as to whether our, our distribution approximates a normal distribution in terms of what we call the peakedness. And if it does not, we'd say we got a bout of kurtosis. So when we get the frequency polygon, we can make a comment on the modality, we can make a comment on the skewness, we can make a comment on kurtosis. Chapter two, kids, that's been Stats with Glenn.